Hello everyone, welcome to the Power Play Chess uh, channel. My name is Robert Riss and I'm here to uh, replace Danny uh, once again uh, as he's uh, pretty busy. I would like to have a look at the Sinkfield Cup. It's round one and what a pairing we have. World champion Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces against his former challenger Jan Nepomnici. It's the first classical game between the two since their match. They have played a number of uh, blitz and rapid games uh, against each other. But as I said, this is their first classical encounter again. And what a start we have. Let's have a look. Magnus with the white pieces. D4, knight of six, c4. And we all know that in the past, Jan used to play this uh, Grunfeld starting with the move uh, g6, followed by d5. But since their world championship match, he has uh, matured his play, as Magnus would uh, call it himself. He um, He's going for more solid setups with the move e6. And now after knight f3, we go d5 and uh, well there are so many possibilities like you you could go knight c3 and uh, we can get uh, typical queen's gambit decline structures but also lines with uh, d takes c4 the so-called uh, vienna also the move g3 is possible leading to the catalan but magnus opts for a small surprise as he goes for c takes d5 it's a typical move leading to the so-called cosbot pawn formation after black recaptures with the e-pawn but after knight c3, c6, this is considered to be pretty harmless because white has already developed its knight to f3. Um, usually in these structures, uh, you would like to go bishop g5, e3, bishop d3, and develop your knight to e2. It's considered to be um, a more ambitious plan, which was introduced back in the days by uh, Botvinnik. And later on, his uh, student Garry Kasparov uh, also employed these lines. And uh, that's considered to be a more dynamical way of playing because the big difference is that white could later on play f3 and try to strike in the center. But we have a different game. The knight is on f3 and uh, white goes bishop f4. Reasonable move, of course, as well. But here we get to see the bishop comes to f5, e3, knight bd7. So far, everything looks uh, pretty normal. And black would be really happy to trade off the, the light squared bishops. And then uh, his position is absolutely solid. Uh, he has managed to, uh, to trade off his worst piece, the, the light squared bishop, because these pawns are placed on the light squares. But since that has been done, I think black is pretty okay. So Magnus goes for a somewhat more ambitious uh, idea as he plays here the move h3. Strange looking move, but pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Bishop e7 and now g4. Sharpening up the, the game and uh, here, very interesting, the, the mostly played move is bishop g6 and then it's still possible to go bishop d3 but I actually think that Magnus was planning to go knight h4 trying to claim the, uh, the bishop pair. That's a typical thing to do in these uh, positions. So Jan goes for a slightly different approach. He plays bishop e4 and this move has been played only one time before by... Magnus Carlsen with the black pieces in a blitz game in Moscow 2009 against uh, Fischi Anand. In that game, Fischi played here bishop g2. Magnus got a, a pretty comfortable game. And later on, after both sides completed their development, these pawn weaknesses, uh, well, they uh, White got some problems with, uh, with his king in the long run. Uh, so, understandably, Magnus deviates from, from his own game. Plays bishop e2. And objectively, this looks all totally fine for black. Like you go queen b6, queen b3, and even here you can just go for the exchange of queens. And well, it's the question whether these pawns are weak or they become an, uh, an asset later on. Important to realize that you cannot go after the pawn on, um, on b3 because here white can simply play rook c1. Black should drop back with the bishop to, uh, to g6 probably because if you would take on b3, there is 92. And if uh, bishop c4, then you can take. And this is like a dream for, for white. Like the, the center has been opened. Two fantastic bishops. And white's main plan will be to start pushing the pawns in the center. The bishops are better than the knights in such cases. So black went back to g6. And now knight h4, according to, uh, according to our plan. Yeah, difficult to say what, uh, what black should do. Black is very solid. Played here to move bishop uh, to b4. Maybe knight e4 is an, uh, is an interesting uh, move as well, trying to, to simplify. 
And that looks looks pretty okay because if you would decide to uh, to take on uh, on e4, then you get a, a square on d5 for your for your knight. So probably this is a this is a reasonable move because after f3 we have bishop h4, and we can uh, go knight g3 next. That's that's okay for black probably. But let's see, bishop b4 played, white takes on g6, and now we have this very nice uh, dynamical pawn formation as white goes f3. And after knight f8, the knight was not doing too much and is on its way to uh, to e6. White's putting the king on f2 in the center. There's no need to castle here at all. And we go bishop, uh, bishop g3. And I think this is the sort of position Magnus is really good at. Um, maybe not a big of a, not a big advantage at uh, at all, but enough to play for enough pawn breaks in the center on the king side. And maybe if uh, Black would ever give up the control over the b4 square, maybe the b pawn could be could be pushed later on as well. So uh, also here, Jan uh, has to decide what to do with his king. I think if you castle queenside, then it would just drop a pawn because of the open a file. Castling kingside probably invites White to start looking for ideas to uh, build up an attack on the king side. So he decides to stay in the center, connect the rooks with each other. Black is uh, black is still okay, probably, but Magnus is going to make little progress, step by step, improving his position. H4 is a, is a good move, gaining more uh, space on the king side. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that around this point, uh, Jan had some difficulties uh, making a plan. A6 is a reasonable move, but will also have some uh, clear drawbacks. I was thinking maybe bishop d6 is, um, is a possible idea, going for the exchange of dark squared bishops. That would be a nice little achievement, but probably even a move like f4 could be, uh, could be considered. Surrendering the, the e4 square for the moment, but still, you, you can go bishop d3, king f3, and start uh, pressing a, a bit. So as I said, a6 played, uh, then at least the rook is uh, free to move. So after king g2, rook a d8 was, uh, was played, anticipating a possible pawn break in the center as uh, the d pawn would become vulnerable. But now white step by step further improving his position, bishop f2. Maybe you're thinking, what the heck is going on? This is not, uh, <laughs> not too, too exciting, but wait a second, guys. This is Carlson style and we will get to see how the bishops are uh, are coming alive. Also for black, it's not simple. What is black going to do? Uh, he's probably just deciding here to uh, to make a number of waiting moves. Bishop uh, b8, and now the knight comes into uh, a4. And here we see that white is planning to go b4, knight c5 with pressure against the pawn on b7. Probably black will, in that case, decide to take, but then we can undouble the pawns and, uh, well, there's still long-term pressure against that backward pawn on b7, while white still has all the chances to break in the center or on the king side. So black decided here to, uh, to go back with the bishop to uh, d6, and now bishop e1, renewing this idea of, uh, of, e, uh, of b4, installing the knight on c5. And uh, apparently uh, Nepomnici didn't like that, and uh, decided to play active. But I think his move, c5, it's really the, the, the start of, uh, of, of his problems. I think the opening of the position really favors the side with the bishops. Knight takes c5, knight takes c5 played. Who knows, maybe bishop takes uh, c5 was an, uh, was an option as well. But in that case, if d takes c5, knight takes c5, bishop b4 can be played. And there are some problems with his pin. So that doesn't look uh, look too great at all. So knight takes c5 played, d takes c5, bishop c5, hitting the pawn on uh, on e3, but bishop d2 is a good move. So now the situation has changed. Black has an isolated uh, pawn in the in the center on the d file, and the attempt to uh, to simplify with a move d4 uh, backfires because white will play e4, and now we have this uh, majority four versus three on the king side. This d pawn is not dangerous at all and white will look for ideas to start pushing the pawns probably got to defend the pawn on uh, on g4 first but this is a very promising uh, situation for white so after bishop d2 black played here to move rook h2 uh, to e8 and now white plays b4 very nice as the point is that after the bishop uh, goes away it went to um, to b6 
D6 is another possibility, but um, yeah, difficult to say. I think B6 makes quite some sense, keeping an eye on the pawn on uh, on E3. But now we see that the the, the pawn on C6 is uh, is missing because White has the possibility now to play the move B5, and this is exactly what White uh, wants because if you would take on B5, we first give a check on B4, and if the king moves, we're gonna take with the bishop and look at the the power exerted. Uh, by um, by these uh, bishops, difficult to say what Black should do if if the knight interferes. Then we have this fantastic plan to to play e4. And after let's say d takes e4, we would go rook h to e1, and we actually do have a kingside attack. There are no queens on the board, but without queens, you can perfectly attack as well. After something like e3, trying to keep the files closed, looks like Black is in okay shape, but Rook a d1, fantastic move, threatening rook d6, massive pressure. And here you see the, the, the main problems black is facing in this opening, in this middle game, when uh, the center gets opened. Uh, this is very, very dangerous, if not just uh, just lost for, for black. So that's the idea of uh, trying to bring the light squared bishop uh, into play. Uh, in the game, black decided to sack a pawn with the move a5. So that after bishop takes a5, bishop takes a5, rook takes a5, okay, white is a pawn up, but it's a double pawn. And probably black can still put up some resistance here. If he does get a couple of moves, um, there are chances to, to fight. But it's a very unpleasant position because there are weaknesses on d5, on b7. So you've got to reckon with uh, rook a7 ideas. But later on, and that's what we're going to see in the game... There are also pawn weaknesses on the king side, and that's all because of White's fantastic pawn play at an earlier stage. King d6, play it in the game, threatening the pawn on uh, on e3, uh, king f2. And now I think, for instance, knight d7 would have been a, a reasonable move. And if you ever attack the pawn on uh, b7, we will go king c7, defending the pawn. The knight is on its way to c5. I would say this is a reasonable defense. I, I, I would estimate like 65, 35 uh, White's, White's winning chances here. But okay, anything can happen. Probably with Magnus, the, the, the winning chances are even uh, higher, of course. After King of 2 Black made a, another inaccurate decision. In my opinion, played here to move Rook E7. I don't like the fact that the rook is going to defend that pawn. I would like to use the king for defending these, uh, these pawns. Secondly... I also think that it's better uh, to have these uh, rooks connected uh, in, uh, at any time. Let's have a look what happens now. Rook d1, good move. Rook h8, uh, attacking the pawn on uh, h4. And of course, king g3, then the pawn on e3 would be hanging. How, sh how should White uh, deal with it? Well, Magnus had seen this, of course, and plays the move g5. That's a very unpleasant move to face because you, you don't want to go with your knight to the side of the board. Knight on h5 would uh, leave the knight out of play. Uh, so the knight went back to, uh, to d7. And here, one fascinating uh, slip by Magnus. He played a good move. He played rook a4, defending the pawn. It's the right idea, but his plan could have been carried out in a more uh, amazing uh, manner as... He could have gone here for the move b6. This is a difficult move to find. Pawn on h4 is hanging. Pawn on b6 you're putting on pre. But the point is that you would like to increase the pressure against that pawn on d5. And launch a decisive mating attack. Let's have a look at both captures. If you take on h4, then the key move is e4. And here we see the, the massive pressure against uh, the, the king. If you take on e4, we have bishop takes e4. Check. King uh, King e6, and now very nice move. Rook a to uh, to d5. The rooks are connected again. If you take the pawn, there is a rook d6, and uh, the knight is hanging, so that's not uh, not an option. If you uh, would go, let's say knight e5, active move, then you're suddenly are getting checkmated in the middle of the board. That's uh, that's a cool idea, I would say. Um, so knight f8 probably the uh, the only other option, but now. After rook d6, king e5, the king doesn't have many squares at all. And now king e3. I love this move. Black's pieces are pretty useless as there's nothing to be done against the, the mating threat of uh, rook 1 uh, to d5. So 
that's basically what happens in case you take the pawn on h4. If you take the pawn on b6, there is rook b5, king c6, for instance, and then you would like to go rook c1, but then there is still knight c4, excellent defensive idea, hitting the, the king while solving the, the, the check. So um, instead uh, of rook c1, you've got to start with e4, undermining that outpost for the knight, after d takes e4, then you give a check, and after king d7, don't take the knight because your bishop is hanging, but you just take on e4, the position has been opened, and now that's pretty uh, pretty bad anyway. Like if you go rook e6, you can even play a quiet move like king g3, lot of pressure, uh, hardly any good moves. If you would move the rook to b8 to uh, free the knight, then h5 is a fantastic uh, resource as well, putting more pressure against the pawn if you would take there's bishop f5. So you see, thanks to the open files and the diagonals, there are so many little tactics in the, in the position. It's a pity that Magnus didn't find uh, this uh, idea with b6, but instead he played rook a4, defending the pawn. And uh, well, if you, if you go knight b6, then probably rook d4, and we will um, continue from here. Let's see, white is better, but it's gonna take some time to convert. In the game there followed knight c5, but now rook g4 was uh, was played and this is a another classy move black would probably have considered to play f6 at any time trying to undouble the pawns but then you see that uh, black can uh, white can just take and then the pawn on g6 is uh, is vulnerable so there's king c7 and that's probably not uh, not a good move because now you're leaving the pawn on d5 in trouble bishop b1 is an excellent move and after rook e5 there's bishop a2, and this pawn is in trouble. If you go rook d8, there's rook gd4, and this pawn is gone. And most importantly, after winning this pawn, rooks can get exchanged. But also this bishop is coming alive, is looking for a way to attack the pawn on f7. And after that, the pawn on g6 is likely to drop as well. So here, Jan got, uh, got kind of desperate. Play the move f6, but that's exactly what... Um, what Magnus had been looking for. Gf6, Gf6. You have a choice between taking the pawn on g6 or the pawn on d5. Well, if you take on g6, there is still rook to, uh, to h4. Don't do that. There's no need. It's probably winning as well, but rook takes d5 is much cleaner. Rooks are getting off the board. There's a knight check. King goes to g3, knight d5. Um, to, to defend the pawn on uh, g6, because if knight takes b2, rook g6, it's a free versus one, totally game over. So knight e5, and here we just bring the rook back, uh, attacking the pawn. Uh, if you would play f5, then the rook is making uh, a space for uh, for the king. We are planning to go king f4, king g5, and wrap up uh, these pawns as well. So that's why uh, black uh, made his counter threat with rook d8, but now the fantastic finish of the game. It's the move b6. And uh, black resigned because if you uh, would take the pawn, then we can simply take on f6 with check. And after uh, doing something with the king, well, if king c5, bishop b7 is even there. If you go king c7, we will just support the bishop. Your two pawns up. You better resign against Magnus. It's only going to be a torture. It's completely hopeless, in fact. And how about the other moves? Well, you, as you see, you have to keep the uh, the pawn defended. If king c8, we Give a check first on e6 before taking the pawn. So that's uh, that's not going to work either. If you go king b8, then we have this simple resource of uh, rook takes f6, rook takes d5, and uh, and rook f8 with, uh, with mate. So uh, this was not forced at all, but it's, it's a nice little uh, touch at the, uh, at the end, thanks to this move b6. So fantastic positional performance in round one by Magnus. And I cannot wait to see what's going to happen. Is he really going to get to the 2900 well winning against a high class player like uh, Jan Nepomnici is a, another step in uh, in that direction so let's see what's going to happen in the, in the next couple of rounds